This morning we've got uh, uh, another really interesting question to wrestle with here. Why did Jesus tell people to not tell people about him? <laughs> at, at first glance, that might seem like a bit of a counterintuitive question, right? Didn't Jesus say, go therefore into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them, uh, uh, teaching them to obey all that I have uh, asked them to do? Um, yeah, he did after his death and resurrection, but before his death and resurrection, there are a handful of times when Jesus does something amazing and then says, don't tell anyone, okay? Why? Why would he do that? Why would Jesus tell people to not tell people about him? As it, as it turns out, um, the person who has asked this question ha has actually identified a question that is a field of scholarly debate uh, in, in scholarly circles. Um, this is known as the messianic secret. Uh, Jesus knew that he was the Messiah. Jesus was committed to being God's Messiah, the anointed one who would deliver his people. And yet there are a handful of, uh, or, or and yet there are a handful of times where Jesus says, "Don't tell anyone the secret." Our job this morning is to figure out why. So join me in uh, the Gospel of Mark this morning. We're going to look in the Gospel of Mark, a handful of passages there to see why to see why it is that Jesus might have said. Don't tell anybody about me. Um, just as an aside, there are about a dozen times that I can find this in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke. Um, but by far, it happens the most often in uh, Luke. He records it most, uh, not Luke, Mark. Uh, he records it most often in, in Mark. So that's where we're going to look today. Um, so Mark 1, starting in, in verse 40. Uh, Mark 1, verse 40, Jesus is starting into his ministry um, and, 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 and if you open a business or start a new endeavor, you want to start with a splash, right? You want to you wanna get some prom promotion and publicity behind yourself. And yet, this is what happens here. Verse 40, a man with leprosy came to Jesus and, and fell on his knees and begged him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cured. <laughs> That's a big splash, right? That's front page news. That's how you bring publicity to yourself. If you want to know people, that, if you want people to know that you're an amazing person, you do an amazing thing, like heal a person from leprosy, and yet. Verse 43, Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See to it that you do not tell anyone about this. But go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Um, Jesus heals the man, and yet he does not want to take credit for it. Right? He is more concerned with this guy's ritual purity that he goes and proves that he is no longer unclean because of his leprosy. Um, uh, <laughs> and so he says, go and, and, and tell the priests. That's what you do. Um, then Jesus says, listen, don't, don't tell anyone. And guess what happens? Verse 45. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly but stayed outside in the lonely places. And yet people came to him from everywhere. Jesus said, don't tell anyone. And he went and told everyone. And the result, I think, is, is one of the reasons that Jesus told people not to tell people about him, right? It's, it's strictly practical. <laughs> Jesus knew that there were things that he needed to do he knew that there were places he needed to go, places where he needed to speak the gospel. If he is surrounded constantly by people, it's going to slow him down. And so I think a very practical reason that Jesus told people not to tell people about him um, was just this. He didn't want to get mobbed by crowds where everybody wants a piece of him. Um, I, I heard this story this week. Uh, uh, not entirely sure if it's true, but it captures the heart of it. Um, Michael Jordan, you've all heard of Michael Jordan, I'm sure, the basketball player, greatest, the great one basketball player. 
Apparently, Michael Jordan had a deal with a barber that he would go down and get his hair cut at this barber shop as long as the barber didn't say anything. And for a while, it worked out well. One of the most famous men on the planet could go get his hair cut in quiet at the barber shop. But then somebody let the word out, and all of a sudden, Michael Jordan couldn't get his hair cut without having a huge crowd of people around him. And so they say that's why he started shaving his head, because he couldn't even get a hair cut without a big crowd of people. That, I think, is what was happening to Jesus. He just needed that ability to get around and do the things that he needed to do. So I think he tried to preserve that messianic secret um, so that he could get around. Um, I don't think that's the only reason, though, so let's keep going. Uh, Flip to Mark 5, Mark 5, verses 40 through 43. Um, There in chapter 5, Jesus meets a a synagogue leader, a a, a priest, a teacher, um, whose daughter is dying. Jesus is on the way to see the the girl um, when he gets waylaid by a a woman with a bleeding problem. Um, Jesus heals her, but by the time he arrives at the girl's house, this girl has already passed away. And yet Jesus says, "Um, why are you all weeping and and wailing? She's not dead. She's just asleep. (laughs) And the weeping and wailing people go, "Uh, I think we know what death looks like. Nonetheless, Jesus took the mom and the dad and a couple of disciples up to see the girl. And he took her by the hand. And he said, Talitha kum, which, by the way, tells us that Jesus spoke Aramaic. Right? Last week we talked about what language Jesus spoke. Talitha kum is the Aramaic way of saying, get up, little one. Get up, she gets. The the dead girl came back to life. The the disciples were astonished. The the parents were astonished. And yet, what does Jesus say? He gave strict orders not to tell anyone about this. Why? Why would he do that? Why would he keep that a secret? I mean, the parents were going to have to dance around the issue of the girl that everybody knew was dead is now very much alive. And yet Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Same over in Mark 7. Look at Mark 7, verse 32. Mark 7, verse 32, some people bring a deaf man to Jesus. They say, "Um, please heal him. He, he He can't talk. He can hardly talk. He is entirely deaf. Please help him. Jesus takes the man aside, puts his fingers into his ears, spits on the ground, touches the man's tongue, and then says, Ephaptha, more Aramaic, be opened. And just like that, the man could speak, the man could hear. And again, verse 36, Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone. The more he did so, the more they kept talking about him. What a nuisance, eh? (laughs) Jesus says, don't say anything, and they say even more. I actually wondered this week, if this is a bit of um, Jesus is doing a bit of reverse psychology on them. <laughs> like, whatever you do, don't eat your broccoli. I'll eat my broccoli and I'll like it. <laughs> don't tell people about me. We're going to tell everybody about you. I wonder if there's something to that. Um, but, but I do want to point out something else in each of those stories. Um, look at verse 736. What does he say specifically? Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it, the miraculous healing. Go back to chapter 5, verse 43. What does he say? He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this, this miraculous healing. Chapter 1, verse 44. See that you don't tell this to anyone. At this point, Jesus is not saying, don't talk about me. He's saying, don't talk about these miraculous things that you have seen me do. Jesus wants to be known not simply for the miraculous things that he does, but for what they mean, which is that the kingdom of God is breaking into human experience. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, not just do parlor tricks. 
And so he wants people to realize that these amazing things are not simply cool actions that he does, but signs of something greater. That greater thing comes up in Mark 8 and verse 9. So hop ahead, Mark 8, verse 28 through 30. Jesus is out with his disciples and he says, who do people say that I am? And the disciples rattle off. Some say John the Baptist. Some say, uh, some say that you were Elijah. And then Jesus says, okay, but who do you say I am? And Peter replies, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. One more small reason why Jesus would have told people not to tell people about him. Um, saying that in Roman-held Judea is a political statement, a political act of rebellion. A messiah uh, is someone who would challenge the supremacy of Rome. And so Jesus doesn't want people to know or to use those words too freely, <laughs> lest Rome think he is a danger to their political power. So he says, don't tell anyone. But it's not just the political part. <clears throat> when Jesus says, don't tell anyone, in verse 30, he warns them not to tell anyone, and then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected, and killed, and after three days, rise again. Jesus is redefining for Peter what a Messiah is. Rome would think, the average Jew would think, that a Christ, a Messiah, would come and give political victory and triumph over all the enemies and, 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 and solve all of our problems. <clears throat> but Jesus says, I'm not that kind of Messiah. So, shh, don't tell anybody until Mark 9, verse 7 through 9, the transfiguration happens. Mark 9, 7 through 9, Peter, James, and John are up on a mountain with Jesus, and all of a sudden he's transformed, right? dazzling white, uh, radiant in glory, walking around, talking to the giants of the faith, Moses and Elijah. And then verse 9, coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Why does Jesus keep downplaying his identity as the Messiah? Here's the thing. The people of Israel in Jesus' day were expecting a Messiah. God said a Messiah would come. And they thought he would be a powerful ruler who would come and fix their problems and heal their diseases and, and triumph over their enemies. If word got out, that Jesus, who was sent by God, healed the deaf and raised the dead and walked on glorious mountains with heroes of old, man, the people would think this is the Messiah who's come to make our lives better. In fact, there are some people who, did, who tried to do that. Um, John chapter 6, verse 15 says that there was a mob of people who came and tried to take Jesus and make him king by force. Because they thought, man, just think what he could do for us. But that's not the kind of Messiah that Jesus came to be. He didn't simply come to be a miracle-working Messiah. He came to be a, a suffering Messiah, a, a redeeming Messiah, whose miracles proved that he was sent by God. That's why Jesus talks about suffering and dying in, in Mark 8. Peter correctly identifies that Jesus is the Messiah, but then Jesus says, I am the Messiah who, counter to your expectation, will not solve all your little problems, but your big one, your estrangement from God, your certainty of death. Jesus says, I'm not a worldly Messiah who fixes your problems. I'm the one who will die to give you life and to restore you to God. That, I think, is why Jesus told people not to say anything. Before his death, he feared that people would miss the point and take him as a, as a conquering Messiah rather than a saving one. 
He knew that he needed to suffer and die and and rise again to to redeem his people. And, And he didn't want anybody to know that he was that until it was clear what kind of Messiah he was. A suffering savior, not a conquering ruler. The messianic secret, though, had an expiry date, didn't it? We just saw it in Mark 9. Uh, Mark 9, verse 9, Jesus tells his disciples not to tell anyone about the transfiguration until after Jesus' death and resurrection. We're past that date. So now, the secret's out. (laughs) The game plan has changed because the game has changed. Now, the issue is not, don't tell anyone. It's, tell everyone. And, and this, I think, is where this question intersects with our, with our lives. Yes, before Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus kept his identity as that saving Messiah a secret. But now, after his death and resurrection, the secret is out, and everyone needs to know. There is a Messiah who conquers death, who makes it so that we need not fear death anymore, who restores us to God and heals the brokenhearted. We who are Christians have firsthand experience of the the healing, of the redemption, of the saving power of Jesus. And so it just makes sense that we would then share uh, our experience of Jesus' redemptive love with other people. Uh, As the majority of commentators that I read this week um, pointed out, Jesus is a secret that is too good to, to keep. Um, Grant Osborne, uh, for example, writes, this is Mark's point, when Christ has changed your life, you must go public with the incredible joy you feel. Think about it. You you go to a movie, a good movie, you go to a good restaurant, and and what do you do? What's your instinct? You want to share it with somebody. This is really silly, and you'll laugh at me. Have you seen seen the Coke with coffee at the grocery store? It's Coke with coffee? (laughs) I tried it. I tried it, and my first thought was, i got to tell my dad. I think he might like this. That's about a can of Coke. (laughs) What about the redemptive love of Jesus in my life? My first instinct needs to be, wow, I want to share this with other people. One, One caveat, though. This issue of the Messianic secret, the fact that Jesus wanted to keep his identity as a Messiah secret until it was clear what kind of Messiah he was, encourages us to think carefully about who it is that we are sharing with people. Right? I think that there are times when evangelism comes down to come to Jesus for what you can get out of him. If you come to Jesus, he will, he will change your life and make everything 100% better, and you can go to him like a heavenly handyman who will fix all of your problems. Jesus does fix your problems. Jesus does work. But a lot of times, he just helps us through them. We persevere alongside of him. And so I think that we need to be aware that we invite people to come to Jesus not for what they can get out of him, but for the eternal and spiritual gifts that he gives to them. Do you see what I mean by that? Not Jesus, what are you going to give, what what can I get out of you? How are you going to fix my earthly problems? But Jesus, I can see how you will help me in my earthly problems and give me the hope of eternal life. Sure, come for the miracles, stay for the gospel. Jesus is a glorious Messiah. He laid down his life um, to restore us to God. He he showed us his love for us. He conquered death. It's no wonder then that Jesus' last words to us and lasting commission to us are, go therefore into all the nations. Go therefore into your neighborhoods. Tell people about me. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You gave us your Son to give us life and hope for eternal life. 
You have conquered death and given us purpose in, in this life. Lord, we pray that you would make us bold, enable us, your servants, to speak your word with boldness. We pray that you would stretch out your hand and do miraculous works of rebirth in people's hearts. Lord, I confess that I heard the, the, the message of the suffering Messiah so many times before I grasped the, the truth of it, the significance of it, the power of it. And it was only when your Holy Spirit came and worked in my heart that I could do that. Spirit, as we go to tell people about Jesus, to say, look at this humble servant Messiah who comes not to bash you into obedience, but who beckons and says, I've laid down my life for you. Come and walk in the good way that I have set before you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to share our experience of love with others, and that you, by your spirit, would make that real in people's hearts. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. And we know that you will be with us as we speak your truth to the world. We pray in Jesus' name.